Shayla, Tiffany, hey girls, hey. Great rising, bitch. Swab. For everybody that's forgotten what Betwabu means, it's a recognizing that you are the house of the Father. I am the house of the Father. Betwabu, Betwabu. Tiffany. I'm, I'm trying to be better, y'all. I'm trying to yoke myself to discipline being here. Before the time I say I'm going to be here, like I said, like last year, I'm going to be here five minutes early. Pray my strength in the Lord. <laughs> no, seriously, no. I was like, you know what? We taking up a level. I got to get better. I got to quit. I got to quit procrastinating in the mornings. I really do. That's just my truth. I be woke. I be woke early. most, most mornings. I really do. I be up. Half the time, me and James be up talking, playing around. As I get done with my praying and stuff, I because I be up early. Right, I'm trying to make sure I get dressed earlier instead of uh, waiting to the last minute to get dressed. Cause sometimes that, that's what happens. I'll be up, and then I'll I'll miscalculate my time, and uh, <laughs> then I'm rushing at the last minute. Oh shoot, I'm supposed to be live in three minutes, you know. And I'm trying to rush and get dressed. Y'all the time. Yana Tak, shalom, brother. Good to see you, good to see you. I've been checking out some of your stuff. I'm like, oh, let's get into it, let's get into it. They ain't ready for it. I don't know, people be, people be, people be talking bad. I'm like, oh, this man is telling the truth. They just, I, I wish they would just, just get into it. Yo, so, yes, yes, yes. So, but I'm glad I, I be excited about some of the stuff you're going to share. It. I challenge you to always research more. I be looking at some of the stuff that y'all be saying over there. I'm like, you know what? I can't quite put my finger on it, but I know he's telling the truth because I've experienced it just on a little level. And I be, I be, I be trying to fully power up. I'm like, Father, whatever it is you got that's accessible to us, let's get it, you know. But one thing that I have run into is what we're talking about now. Uh, the power of using your heavenly language and how it's being done everywhere. They just call it different things. I'm telling you, that's like, like people say marijuana is the gateway drug. Praying in tongues is the gateway spiritual gift that that opens you up to all the other ones. Like they just, yeah, so I'm excited about this, y'all. We're going to finish up this book today. Uh, we got to start this book tomorrow and get into it. I'm so excited about it. I already got the third book picked out <laughs> after we finished the other one. Um, I'm definitely not going to tell y'all about that one yet. Y'all might not be able to handle that one, but it's from another perspective. And it really gets in deep of what it is or what people would call esoteric. It's not really esoteric. And I think those are wrong words to put on it because it scares you away, especially if you from, come from the Christian standpoint, you know, so, but that's what I said, we're going we gonna to walk along this journey together. So by the time it's time for us to get into it, you at least stay long enough just to hear the matter out, right? I'd be so excited about this. Okay, y'all. Happy Thursday. It is December the 16th, 2021, day 329 of year three of reading through the books of the law and the prophets, another three-year consecutive Three year consecutive, they count day 997. Y'all, we're going to read set, not second. First Maccabees, and we're only going to do two chapters because they're so long. Uh, chapter four and five. And then we're going to finish up the rest of this little book. Jesus never existed, right? Okay. So let's go ahead and do the Shema chapter. Yes, we are all learning. And it, it's, an, it's an exciting journey. It really is. Okay. Pull this up. It's found, y'all, in Deuteronomy chapter 6. A call for a wholehearted commitment. 
these are the commands, decrees, and regulations that Yahuwah, your God, commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy, and you and your children and grandchildren must fear Yahuwah, your God, as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as Yahuwah, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, Yahuwah, our God, he is God alone. And you must love Yahuwah, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Then Yahuwah, your God, will soon bring you into the land he swore to give you when he made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses will be richly stocked with goods you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig, and you will eat from vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. When you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget Yahuwah, who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear Yahuwah, your God, and serve him. When you take an oath, you must only use his name. You must not worship any of the gods of the neighboring nations, for Yahuwah, your God, who lives among you, is a jealous God. His anger will flare up against you, and he will wipe you from the face of the earth. You must not touch Yahuwah, your God, as you did when you complained at Massa. You must diligently obey the commands of Yahuwah, your God, all the laws and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in Yahuwah's sight, so all will go well with you. Then you will enter and occupy the good land that Yahuwah swore to give to your ancestors. You will drive out all the enemies living in the land just as Yahuwah said you would. In the future, your children will ask you, what is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations that Yahuwah our God has commanded us to obey? Then you must tell them, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but Yahuwah brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand. Yahuwah did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land he had sworn to give to our ancestors. And Yahuwah our God commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear him so he can continue to bless us and preserve our lives as he has done to this day. For we will be counted as righteous when we obey all the commands Yahuwah our God has given us. Levon, blessings. Hey, girl, hey. Okay, y'all. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. In my big old Bible. Okay. First book of Maccabees, chapter four. Remember, we're taking it down to two. So we'll be able to do the reading out the um our companion reading that we're doing from um uh, jesus never existed so we can actually finish it we'll be done with it today so we can start this next book all right y'all first maccabees chapter four then took gorgias five thousand footmen and a thousand of the best horsemen and removed out of the camp by night. To the end, he might rush in upon the camp of the Yahudim and smite them suddenly. And the men of the fortress were his guides. Now, when Yehuda heard thereof, he himself removed and the valiant men with him that he might smite the king's army, which was at Yemen. While as yet the forces were dispersed from the camp, in the mean season came Gorgias by night into the camp of Yehuda, and when he found no man there, he sought them in the mountains, for he said, These fellows flee from us. But as soon as it was day, Yehuda showed himself in the plain with three thousand men who nevertheless had, had neither armor nor swords to their minds. 
And they saw the camp of the heathen, that it was strong and well harnessed, and compassed round about with horsemen, and these were expert of war. So remember yesterday we found out that they ransacked Jerusalem, right? And all the holy ones, those who were actually keeping Torah, they fled to the mountains. Those ones that was half-stepping already or they was afraid for their lives, they, they gave up Torah and they submitted to, to the enemy. And they decided that they was just going to violate Torah in order to, to keep their lives, right? So now Yehuda, him and the righteous men, is like, you know what, we'll fight to the bloody devil. Let's go ahead and get out of here right now. But if they come for us, we're going to stand up to them, even if it's on the Sabbath, right? Because that's how the first lot of them got killed. Um, because the, the enemy knew that they obey the Sabbath and they figured this would be the best day to attack them because they're resting and they don't violate their laws. And so when they came up against them and it was the Sabbath, they said, you're just going to have to kill us. Because even to the death of us, we would not violate the Sabbath, right? I was like, mm, I don't know that I could have been a part of that group because you ain't going to step to me and try and fight me. And I'm just going to turn the other cheek. Mm -mm, not on my watch. We're going to be fighting. I'm just going to have to look. Y'all, he hit me first, right? <laughs> I'm not. I'm sorry, right? So, but these guys, Yehuda and them, once they saw that, they said, yo, we ain't going out like that. And if they come for us on the Sabbath, Everybody better be ready to fight, right? We're going to defend ourselves on the Sabbath and the days that's not the Sabbath, right? Okay, so that's where we at. And so they come up against them again. Then said Yehuda to the men that were with him, Fear ye not their multitude, neither be ye afraid of their assault. Remember how our fathers were delivered into the Red Sea when Pharaoh pursued them with an army. Now, therefore, let us cry unto heaven, if perchance Yahuwah will have mercy upon us, and remember the covenant of our fathers, and destroy this host before our face this day, that so all the heathen may know that there is one who delivers and saves Yasharal. Remember, Yasharal is another name for Israel, or Yisaela, or Yisolili. Then the strangers lifted up their eyes and saw them coming over against them, wherefore they went out of the camp to battle. But they that were with Yehuda sounded their shofars, so they joined the battle, and the heathen, and the heathen being discomfited, fled into the plain. Howbeit all the hindmost of them were slain with the sword, but they pursued them unto Gazam, and unto the plains of Edom, and Ashdod, and Yavnel, so that there were slain of them upon a three thousand men, so that so that there, so that there were slain of them upon a three thousand men. It has a the a seems misplaced. I'm gonna keep reading. This done, Yehuda returned again with his host from pursuing them, and said to the people, "Be not greedy of the spoil." Inasmuch as there is a battle before us, and Gorgias and his hosts are here by us in the mountain, but stand ye now against our enemies and overcome them, and after this ye may boldly take the spoils. As Yehuda was yet speaking these words, there appeared a part of them looking out of the mountain, who when they perceived that the Yahudim had put their hosts to flight and were burning the tents, for the smoke that was seen declared what was done. When therefore they perceived these things, they were sore afraid, and seeing also the hosts of Yehuda in the plain ready to fight, they fled every one into the land of the strangers. Then Yehuda returned to spoil the tents where they got much gold and silver and blue silk and purple of the sea and great riches. After this, they went home and sung a song of thanksgiving and praised Yehuda in heaven because he is good, because his mercy endures forever. Yes, amen. Thus, Yasharal had a great deliverance that day. Now all the strangers that had escaped came and told Ly Lysias what had happened, who, when he heard thereof, was confounded and discouraged, because neither such things as he would were done unto Yasharal, nor such things as the king commanded him were come to pass. The next year, therefore, following Lysias, gathered together three score thousand choice men of foot and five thousand horsemen that he might subdue them. So they came into Edom and pitched their tents at Bet Surah, 
And Yehuda met them with 10,000 men. And when he saw that mighty army, he prayed and said, Blessed O you, O Savior of Yasharal, who did quell the violence of the mighty man by the hand of your servant David, and gave the host of strangers into the hands of Yonatan, the son of Shaul, and his armor bearer. Shut up this army into the hand of your people, Yasharal, and let them be confounded in their power and horsemen. Make them to be of no courage, and cause the boldness of their strength to fall away, and let them quake at their destruction. Cast them down with the sword of them that love you, and let those that know your name praise you with thanksgiving. So they joined battle, and there were slain of the host of Lysias about five thousand men. Even before them were they slain. Now when Lysias saw his army put to flight, and the manliness of Yehuda's soldiers, and how they were ready either to live or die valiantly, val valiantly, he went into Antioch and gathered together a company of strangers, and having made his army greater than it was, he purposed to come again into Yehuda. Then said Yehuda and his brethren, Behold, our enemies are discomfited. Let us go up and let us go up to cleanse and dedicate the sanctuary. Upon this, all the hosts assembled themselves together and went up into Mount Zion. And when they saw the sanctuary desolate and the altar profane and the gates burned up and shrubs growing in the courts as a forest or in one of the mountains, yea, and the priest's chambers pulled down, they rent their clothes and made great lamentation and cast ashes upon their head and fell down flat to the ground upon their faces and blew an alarm with the shofars and cried toward heaven. Then Yehuda appointed certain men to fight against those that were in the fortress until he had cleansed the sanctuary. So he chose priests of blameless conversation, such as those that had pleasure in the Torah, who cleansed the sanctuary and bore out the defiled stones into an unclean place. And when they had consulted what to do with the altar of burnt offerings, which was profane, they thought it best to pull it down, lest it should be a reproach to them because the heathen had defiled it. Wherefore they pulled it down and laid up the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should come a prophet to show what should be done with them. Then they took whole stones according to the Torah and built a new altar according to the former and made up the sanctuary and the things that were within the temple and hallowed the temple courts. And if you remember when we were reading through the Torah, remember how when Yahuwah said, when you make an altar unto him, that it shouldn't be of cut stone. Like, but you look at altars everywhere, even in church, they didn't chisel stones and everything they do in the side of the church is the complete opposite of what Yahuwah told them to do, right? They, they specifically called this out, according to the Torah, uncut stones, right? They got it and they just laid it and assembled it. They didn't put any kind of stone cutting any kind of tool towards the stones they left it untouched right okay i'll read that again verse 46 and laid up the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should come a prophet to show them what should be done with them then they took whole stones according to the torah and built a new altar according to the former and made up the sanctuary and the things that were within the temple and hallowed the courts they also they made also new holy vessels into the temple. They bought the menorah and the altar of burnt offerings and of incense and the table. And upon the altar, they burnt incense and the lamps that were upon the menorah, they lighted and that they might give light in the temple. Furthermore, they set the loaves upon the table and spread out the veils and finished all the works which they had begun to make. Now on the five and twentieth day of the ninth month, which is called the month of Kislev, in the hundred forty and eighth year, they rose up early in the morning and offered sacrifice according to the Torah upon the new altar of burnt offerings, which they had made. Look at what time and what day the heathen had profaned it, even in that 
was it dedicated with songs and cisterns and harps and cymbals. Then all the people fell upon their faces, worshiping and praising the Elohim of heaven, who had given them good success. And so they kept the dedication of the altar eight days and offered burnt offerings with gladness and sacrificed the sacrifice of deliverance and praise. See that? Just like it said in Psalm, like King David said, he offered the sacri- the, the bulls of his lips as a sacrifice. Who would say, stop killing my animals. I don't want that. Leave them alone. They ain't did nothing to you. Right? He said, give me the bulls of your lips. Slaughter that animal. You. I want you. Right? Right here. Listen, this is what they said. And so they kept the dedication of the altar eight days and offered burnt offerings with gladness and sacrificed the sacrifice of deliverance and praise. They decked also the forefront of the temple with crowns of gold and with shields and the gates and the chambers they renewed and hanged doors upon them. Thus was very great gladness among the people for that the reproach of the heathen was put away. Moreover, Yehuda and his brethren with the whole assembly of Yasharal ordained that the days of the dedication of the altar should be kept in their season from year to year by the space of eight days from the five and twentieth day of the month Kislev with mirth and gladness. At that time they also built up Mount Zion with high walls and strong towers round about lest the other nations should come and tread it down as they had done before. And they set there a garrison to keep it and fortified Betsura to guard it, that the people might have a defense against Edom. Adia, shalom, good morning. Auntie, shalom, shalom, Belinda Brown. <laughs> okay, y'all, next chapter, First Maccabees chapter 5. Now, when the nations round about heard that the altar was built and the sanctuary renewed as before, it displeased them very much. Wherefore, they thought to destroy the generation of Yaakov. Remember, Yaakov is another name. Well, it's translated Jacob, Yaakov. Wherefore, they thought to destroy the generation of Yaakov that was among them. And thereupon, they began to slay and destroy the people. Then Yehuda fought against the children of Esau in Edom at Arabatim. Because they besieged Gael, and he gave them a great overthrow, and abated their courage, and took their spoils. Also, he remembered the injury of the children of Bean, who had been a snare and, and an offense unto the people, and that they lay wait for them in the ways. He shut them up, therefore, in the towers, and encamped against them, and destroyed them utterly. And burnt the towers of that place with fire and all that were therein. Afterward, he passed over to the children of Ammon, where he found a mighty power and much people with Timotheus, their captain. So he fought many battles with them till at length they were discomfited before him and he smote them. And when he had taken Yazar with the towns belonging thereto, he returned into Yehuda. Then the heathen that were at Gilad assembled themselves together against Yasharal that were in their quarters to destroy them, but they fled to the fortress of Dathamia. I'm sorry, Dath, Dathama. And sent Sephirim unto Yehuda and his brethren. The heathen that are round about us are assembled together against us to destroy us, and they are preparing to come and take the fortress where unto we are fled, Timotheus being the captain of their host. Come now, therefore, and deliver us from their hands, for many of us are slain. Yea, all of our brethren that were in the places of Toviyahu are put to death. Their women and their children also have they carried away captives and borne away their stuff. And they have destroyed there about a thousand men. While these Sephirim were yet reading, behold, there came other messengers from Galil with their clothes rent, who reported on this wise, and said, They of Akko, and of Zor, and of Sidon, and Galil of other, I'm sorry, and all Galil of other nations are assembled together against us to consume us. Now when Yehuda and the people heard these words, 
there assemble a great assembly together to consult what they should do for their brethren that were in trouble and assaulted of them. Then said Yehuda unto Shimon his brother, Choose you out men, and go deliver your brethren that are in Galil. For I and Yonatan my brother will go into the country of Gilad. So he left Yosef, the son of Zechariah, who and Azariah, who the captains of the people, and the remnant of the host in Yehuda to keep it, unto whom he gave commandment, saying, Take ye charge of this people, and see that ye not make war against the heathen until the time that we come again. Now unto Shimon were given 3,000 men to go into Galil, and unto Yehuda 8,000 men for the country of Gilad. Then when Shimon, then went Shimon into Galil, where he fought many battles with the heathen, so that the heathen were discomfited by him. And he pursued them unto the gate of Akko, and there were slain of the heathen about 3,000 men, whose spoils he took. And those that were in Galil and in Arbatis, with their women and their children and all that they had, took he away with him and brought them into Yehuda with great joy. Yehuda Maccabee also and his brother Yonatan went over the Yarden and traveled three days' journey in the wilderness, where they met with the Nebatheim, who came unto them in a peaceable manner, and told them everything that had happened unto their brethren in the land of Gilad, and how many of them were shut up in Bo Bosora and Beor and Alima and Casphor, Mag, as M A G E D, Mag, and Ashtara, Karanaim. All these cities are strong and great. And that they were shut up in the rest of the cities of the country of Gilad, and that against tomorrow they had appointed to bring their host against the forts, and to take them and to destroy them all in one day. Hereupon Yehuda and his host turned suddenly by the way of the wilderness unto Basora, and when he had won the city, he slew all the males with the edge of the sword, and took all their spoils, and burnt the city with fire. From whence he removed by night and went till he came, and went till he came to the fortress. And early in the morning they looked up, and behold, there was an innumerable people bearing ladders and other engines of war to take the fortress, for they assaulted them. When Yehuda therefore saw that the battle was begun, and that the cry of the city went up to heaven with shofars and with a great sound. He said unto his host, Fight this day for your brethren. So he went forth behind them in three companies, who sounded their shofars and cried with prayer. Then the host of Timotheus, knowing that it was Yehuda Maccabee, fled from him, wherefore he smote them with a great slaughter, so that there were killed of them that day about eight thousand men. This done, Yehuda turned aside to Mizpah, and after he had assaulted it, he took and slew all the males therein, and received the spoils thereof, and burnt it with fire. From thence went he, and took Casphor, Mag, Beor, and the other cities of the country of Gilad. After these things gathered, Tim after these things gathered Timotheus another host, and encamped against Raphon beyond the brook. So Yehuda sent men to espy the host, who brought him word, saying, All the heathen that be round about us are assembled unto them, even a very great host. He has also hired Avarim to help them, and they have pitched their tents beyond the brook, ready to come and fight against you. Upon this, Yehuda went to meet them. And then Timotheus said unto the captains of his host, when Yahuwah and his host come near the brook, if he pass over first unto us, we shall not be with we shall not be able to withstand him, for he will mightily prevail against us. But if he be afraid and camp beyond the river, we shall go over unto him and prevail against him. Now when Yehuda came near the brook, he calls the scribes of the people to remain by the brook unto unto whom he gave commandment, saying Suffer no man to remain in the camp, but let all come to battle. So he went first over unto them and all the people after him, 
Then all the heathen, being discomfited before him, cast away their weapons and fled into the temple that was at Asherah Karanam. But they took the city and burnt the temple with all that were therein. Y'all got to remember, the way that they looked at the temple, they figured this is a safe place. So when it's time to run, if we can't get away, just go into the temple, right? They they wouldn't dare burn it. They wouldn't dare. Oh, y'all messing with, with Judah Maccabee. No, burn it to the ground and everybody in it. Gil, shalom, Marie, shalom, shalom. Listen, hold on. So he went first over into them and all the people after him. Then all the heathen, being discomfited before him, cast away their weapons and fled unto the temple that was at Ashtaroth Karanam. But they took the city and burnt the temple with all that were therein. Thus was Ashtaroth Karanam subdued. Neither could they stand any longer before Yehuda. Then Yehuda gathered together all Yasharal that were in the country of Gilad, from the least unto the greatest, even their women and children and their stuff, a very great host, to the end that they might come into the land of Yehuda. Now when they came unto Ephron, this was a great city in the way they should go, very well fortified. They could not turn from it, either on the right hand or the left, but must needs pass through the midst of it. Then they of the city shut them out and stopped up the gates with stones. Whereupon Yehuda sent unto them in a peaceable manner, saying, Let us pass through your land to go into our own country, and none shall do any and none shall do you any hurt. We will only pass through on foot, howbeit they would not open unto him. Wherefore Yehuda commanded a proclamation to be made throughout the host that every man should pitch his tent in the place where he was. So the soldiers pitched and assaulted the city all that day and night, till at the length of the city was delivered into his hands, who then slew all the males with the edge of the sword, and razed the city, and took the spoils thereof, and passed through the city over them that were slain. And it kind of sounds familiar, right? That's what Israel did when it was in the wilderness. Remember, the wilderness wasn't just desert. It was other nations that they were passing through. And some of them treated them the same way. They said, let us pass through your land. I make sure none of my people, they harm none of your people. We ain't going to eat your food. We, we're going to make sure our camels don't drink your water. We got everything that we need in the midst of us. And if anybody of our people, if, if they drink it in your water or eat it in your food, we will recompense you for it. They said, no, find another way to go. Come on, you don't want no smoke with us. We, we, we just need to get right through here. No, turn around. And then all hell broke loose, right? So that happened a couple times in the wilderness. So remember, the wild, it was like a wilderness of the people. You hear a lot of people talking about who was going to bring us back into the wilderness of the people. We could get into that, but we won't, right? But just think about where Israel was in the wilderness of the people as well, right? It wasn't just desert land. It was They were literally among cities of other people. How do we know that? Because Torah tells us about the different nations that they encountered while they were in the wilderness. I'm just saying, sometimes we don't pay attention to what's right in front of our face. Okay. So the soldiers pitched and assaulted the city all that day and all that night, till at the length the city was delivered into his hands, who then slew all the males with the edge of the sword and raised the city and took the spoils thereof and passed through the city over them that were slain. After this went they over the yard and unto the great plain before Bet Sand. And Yehuda gathered together those that came behind and exhorted all the people all the way through till they came into the land of Yehuda. So they went up into Mount Zion with joy and gladness where they offered burnt offerings because not one of them were slain until they had returned in peace. Now what time as Yehuda and Yonatan were in the land of Gilad and Shimon, his brother in Galil before Akko, Yosef, the son of Zechariah, and Azariah, captains of the garrisons, heard of the valiant acts and warlike deeds which they had done. Wherefore, they said, Let us also get us a name and go and fight against the heathen that are round about us. So when they had given charge unto the garrison that was with them, they went toward Yavanel. Then came Gorgias 
and his men out of the city to fight against them. And so it was that Yosef and Azariah, who were put to flight and pursued unto the borders of Yehuda, and there they were slain that and there were slain that day of the people of Yasharal about 2,000 men. Don't that sound familiar? A New Testament story? Remember the seven sons of Sceva? I'm just saying. All right, look. That's like, oh, Paul we know. Jesus we know. But who are you, right? They saw what happened when Yehuda and his men went up. And they became famous. Oh, shoot. What? You beat them? Come on, let's go. We're going to go get us a name too. Uh, Yehuda Maccabee we know, but who are you? And so it was that Yosef and Azariah who were put to flight and pursued unto the borders of Yehuda, and there were slain that day of the people of Yasharal, about 2,000 men. Thus was there a great overthrow among the children of Yasharal because they were not obedient unto Yehuda and his brethren but thought to do some valiant act. Moreover, these men came not of the seed of those by whose hand deliverance was given unto Yasharal. Right? Y'all done got the big head and got y'all tails toe off. Good enough for you. Like <laughs> right, my grandma used to say, good enough for you. Go sit your tail down somewhere. <laughs> How be it, the man Yehuda and his brethren were greatly renowned in the sight of all Yasharal and all the heathen wheresoever their name was heard of so much so as the people assembled unto them with joyful acclamations afterward went Yehuda forth with his brethren and fought against the children of Esau in the land toward the Negev where he smote Chevron and the towns thereof and pulled down the fortress of it and burnt the towers thereof round about from thence he removed to go into the land of the Philistines and pass through Shamaran. At that time, certain priests desirous to show their valor were slain in battle for that they went out to fight unadvisedly. So Yehuda turned to Ashdod in the land of the Philistines. And when he had pulled down their altars and burnt their carved images with fire and spoiled their cities, he returned into the land of Yehuda. And that is where we will pause today, my beautiful people. We're going to hop on over here and finish up this book, The Jesus Never Existed. I hope y'all enjoying the book of Maccabees if y'all never read it. It's really, really an exciting read. Um, it's kind of long, but it's still good nevertheless. Jeez, shalom. All right, y'all. So we pause on page... Got the page. We paused on page 90. And we should go to the end of this interview and finish this up. Let me have some references. Is it for references? No. I thought it was references. No, it just goes to the end of the interview and that's it. So we should be done with this today. Okay. So I'm going to refresh you on a question that was asked. Remember, he was going through the time periods and he was asking him, how did he see the, synchro the, the synchronism happen over the years and throughout the religions and how they all began to mesh together and become like this, this one thing, right? Where all the religions are joined together. So here's the question. <clears throat> okay. Dispensing with redactive pet theories then hold on dispensing with reductive pet theories then is it possible to offer a qualified account of how a fictive jesus emerged through synchronistic processes can you provide a summary your own judgment of the basic chronology and the comparative importance of specific outside influences along the way so he's saying, okay, so show us how this happened over the period of time and all the outside resources that they used to combine to create this Jesus character um, and everything that was kind of involved with it, right? So we went through the first few things he gave. If you missed that, you want to hear it again? Just kind of go back a couple of days. I don't want to reread it. We're going to keep going, right? Because I really want to finish this book today. Okay, <clears throat> so the, I, I will give you the title. So the, the first... With the first one, he 
he gave the fourth through the first centuries BC. Then after that, he gave the first century BC to first century AD. Then he talked about post first Jewish war, 70 through 117 AD. And now we're here, post Ketos war, K-I-T-O-S, and that's 117 through 135 AD. Okay. The Gospel of Proto Mark is revised by Gentile God fearers, undermining its Jewish roots. The Jesus travel, the Jesus travel narrative is composed: the Elijah, Elisha cycle, Homer's Odyssey, and early Mark. Right, those are the references whereby the road that Jesus traveled was pulled from Elijah, Elisha. Homer's Odyssey, the early book of Mark. Remember the early book of Mark that was composed is no longer there. It's a whole new different Mark that they're using in the um the New Testament. Find out more about that in Shakespeare's Secret Messiah and also Caesar's Messiah. It gives a lot of good details on that. With the failure of the kingdom of God to materialize and following a further disaster, the Ketos War 115 through 117. Mark is extended and revised into what will become Matthew with the addition of long didact I'm sorry with the addition of long didactic sermons. The text is no longer a play or understood as allegory, but purports to be history with Jesus the Nazarene historicized into Jesus of Nazareth. I think we'll talk about that. Matthew emphasizes the root, the Jewish roots of the faith while attacking Jewish orthodoxy, which rejects the Christian innovations. The biography of Jesus is fleshed out by pagan borrowings, miraculous birth, resurrection appearances. And you can find that in Matthew. Influenced by the pagan mystery cults, Christ becomes worthy of worship as a god. Celebrants now partake of the Lord's Supper, shared with the gods, the Lord Christ. Other borrowings, other borrowings include libations poured over a revered image, ceremonial perambulations with chanting and hymns. The Jesus Christ movement begins to begins the absorption of the baptism sectarians as events in the John the Baptist narrative. The next section, post bar, Koch bar war. Koch bar is C, I'm sorry, K O C H B A R. Post bar, Koch bar war. And that's 135 and later, second century. And after another catastrophic defeat in war and faced with Roman, I pro, I pro, I I'll look it up. Hold on. Opprobrium. I think it's opprobrium. Oppro op opprobrium. Yeah, let me just since I didn't pull it up. It ain't playing. My volume up? Yeah. Oh, okay, with well, space out. Op, yeah, opprobrium. Opprobrium means harsh criticism or censure. Okay. After another catastrophic defeat in war and faced with Roman opprobrium or Roman harsh criticism for all things Jewish, the Marcion led Christians reject all Jewish connections. The Jewishness of Jesus himself is minimized. His appearance on earth had the purpose of forging a new covenant with the elect, the Christians who are now the true Israel, the true Israel. And then it has in the parentheses Marcion's Evangelicon Gospel of the Lord, a proto Luke and apostolicon 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 beginning of anti-semitism the temple of stone is superseded by a temple in spirit gospel of the egyptians 
a salvic mystery forms around a mythical Christos no longer seen as a Jewish messianic figure. This Christos had appeared in human likeness a few decades before the fall of Zion. In response to the challenge from the Marcionite Church, Catholics rewrite Proto-Luke to remove the overtly anti-Jewish anti -Jewish bias of Marcion and at the same time provide a text which displaces the two Jewish Mark and Matthew. Proto-Orthodox churches are given a divinely sanctioned pedigree, Acts of the Apostles, and the churches compete to adopt an apostle as their purported founder. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth is fused with the Lord Christ, and the Christ and Jesus sects are themselves fused. Sex, S-E-T-C-S. -S. Tanya 3000, Shalom. Jesus Christ the Lord accretes the claims and characteristics of all earlier gods, Mithras, Dionysus, etc. Church hierarchy develops further and additional letters are written to sanctify and stress the divinely ordained authority of bishops or Pauline pastorals, Ignatian epistles. Conflicts continue between Catholic Marcionite and Gnostic churches. The Gospel of John is written to silence the Gnostics. Mom, shalom. The third century. Multiple Christian cults, Catholics, Docetus, Ebonite, etc., compete with each other as well with as well as with cults of Isis, Dionysus, Mithraism, Mechanism. Rabbinic Judaism, etc. Political instability, more than two dozen emperors in as many years, serves as a catalyst for religious innovation, a search for a universal religion that both disciplines and homogenizes faith and gives an aura of divine approval to the ruling monarch, Diocletian, Hercules, Constantine, Apollo unsuccessful attempts by late pagan emperors to promote alternatives to Christianity, Deo Soli Invicto Mithrae, Invincible Sun God Mithra, Constantine opts for the Christians, nemesis of his political rivals in the Eastern Empire. Uncle J. B. Grand Rising. The 4th century. In 325, a triumphant Constantine protects his dynasty with divine endorsement bestowed by right-thinking Orthodox Catholics. The Good Shepherd Christ becomes an imperious judge like the emperor himself. I'm sorry, y'all. I got this plant right here. And that, that one gnat is plucking my nerves. You know, sometimes we put plants outside and you bring them back in and you have a gnat problem. So I got like the little uh, apple cider vinegar. I need to refresh it because Bella then tipped it over inside the plant. Okay, I digress. During his brief reign, 360 to 363, Emperor Julian attempts to restore worship of the pagan gods. The episode terrifies the bishops, fearing that they might lose their recently gained power. Catholic intolerance toward the polytheists and all other rivals intensifies. The imperial cult is folded into Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. The imperial cult is is folded into the Jesus Christ cult, and in 381, Jesus Christ is fused with God. Heresy is defined as treason punishable by death. The pagan opposition is eliminated. Temples are converted into churches or closed, abandoned, and pillaged, right? And a lot of them also have been built over with, um, like, the the big Catholic, uh, um, what do you call it, historical churches and stuff. Like, they were, they were built over ruins, right, to try and hide it so nobody would come messing with it. Oh, and they labeled, they built this church, label it historic so nobody can touch it. Nobody can go snooping around right don't touch this this is a historical site rope it off 
you're not allowed here, right? If you're allowed here, we got people on watch watching you, making sure you ain't watching for stuff that we hid from you. Okay, don't get me started. Okay. Y'all, I thought about it. It's not funny. That dog, we got a neighbor down the block. They got a Rottweiler, right? I was taking out trash the other day, and I heard a woman scream. Bella was with me. I heard a woman scream. And my, my husband and them, this this was not this was not not last week, like the week before last. Right. And so it was I had a lot of energy. I'm like, I'm just gonna go ahead and pull it out. Being where it works, I'm gonna go and pull it out myself. Right. Um, so we pulled it out and I heard a woman scream. Like I said, everything was going out, the 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 recycle bins and the regular trash can. So and I had my headphones in my ear and I was I was bumping some worship music, right? I was in a zone, but I heard a woman scream over my music and I'm thinking, is that I'm like and I took one out. And I heard, I heard the scream again. And when I turned, because I, I looked, I was out by the street and I looked left and I looked right and I heard the scream again. And that's when, when I heard it again, I turned the music down. I was like, where's the scream coming from? Bella was right here beside me. And so I turned behind me. And as I looked down through like the, the alley of the houses where people bring their trash cans out through the grass and stuff to bring it out to the street, I seen this woman who I then recognized as my neighbor who lives behind us, she was leaned up against the fence, like holding the gate shut and she was screaming. I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? And she like, her, and she's a Caucasian lady. She's really sweet. Her face is red and like she's screaming. She was like, help, somebody help. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and I ain't have my pistol on me. I'm like, oh shoot. And I grabbed Bella. I'm like, what's wrong? She said, this dog. I'm like, oh, shoot. I said, like, Bella, get in the gate. So Bella took off, ran in the gate. I pushed our gate shut. And I'm thinking, I realized the gate she was standing at, it was down with this huge freaking Rottweiler. It looked like a, a, a mastiff. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do to help this one. Lord, let somebody come and get this dog. Because if we had a fight, I don't know how I'm going to help sis. Because <laughs> if he get a hold of one of us, you know the guy down here that got the Rottweiler, yeah. not the one with the pit bull, the one with the huge Rottweiler. Yeah. He got loose. The gate, their gate was broke, and he got out. You know the lady back here with the the two little mixed little girls. Oh my God, not she. Two, she got one. No, they got. Are you, are you telling one. a story about what you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, okay. oh my gosh. And but what happened was I was gonna go help. I'm like, Father, send help now. I was like, cause I ain't fighting no dog. <laughs> that dog is big like a horse. Like we gonna have to jump on his back. And I pray to y'all that he don't open his mouth and get a hold of none of our skin because I don't know what I'm going to do. So while I'm going down there, I'm looking for something to pick up, metal or something. Otherwise, I would have shot the dog dead. I'm glad they came and got him because they would have called Peter on me. I ain't playing with no Rottweiler. You better tame your animal. <laughs> I, ain't for hurting, I ain't for hurting creation, but to defend our life, hey, I'm just saying, put your animals up. Mexican, what was the governor saying? Oh, the president? He said, kill him dead. <laughs> he, said, no, he said, shoot him dead. Yeah. I'm like, who? That president, like, he wasn't playing. He said, we don't care. Shoot him dead. I'm, I'm glad we don't live over there. I forget what country that was. <laughs> um, But anyway, by the time I had got over there, the guy had come out. And I, bless y'all, the man was home. And he must have heard the screaming and stuff himself. You know, I had to make sure my baby was secure first. Push the gate shut. Boom. So if something pop off. I'm like, go in there, call Jeremiah, get in the gate, go get Jeremiah while we trying to figure out what's going on. So, but he got out, he got her. She about during there had a heart attack. You know, I felt so bad. She was shaking us. She's oh my God, oh my God. I'm like, oh, but I don't know. That has nothing to do with the reading today, but I heard the dog. It was a big bark. Y'all probably heard it, but it reminded me of that story. So I'm glad the man showed up <laughs> and they got that gate fixed. People always remember. Oh, and yeah. Traffic. You remember traumatic things, right? Yeah, it's like indelibly, indelibly imprinted 
on your mind, right? But when you know that about how the mind works, you can use it on purpose. Like you forget everything else except things that are like extremely exciting, get your emotions going or something that's really tragic. If something happened to you that was really tragic when you was one or two, you're going to remember it, right? Because it's almost like a snapshot. And it's, it's, it's snapshot in your brain because you fused emotions with um, that thing that was going on, right? And it keeps it locked in there and it keeps it accessible to you. And it links it to, you You link it to something, a sound or a smell. So you know how something, you may experience something when you're younger or grandma cooking a certain dish and a smell. And when you get older in life, you smell that same smell. It, it locates that memory in your mind and it reminds you, you hook it to things to access the memories. Yeah, so, but yeah. Children of Jerusalem, shalom, shalom. Okay, let me get back to the reading. I'm sorry. The dog bark took me off. Okay. All right, hold on. I got something to take you off. Babe. Not today. <laughs> not, not today. I got you. I know you do, babe. Hard head, shalom. I know it is. Go get dressed so we can go when I'm done. What you want when I got now? You sitting down here trying to sweet talk me. We're trying to finish this book today, babe. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Don't yes, you baby. Like what I, do? I love it. I absolutely love it. I got it. some more for you. The Christian canon it's a is, way. It's a is way. determined. It's a Let's hold this for a marriage course. Let's do a marriage course together so everybody can see your handsome face beside me instead of hear you listen, listen, in the background. Listen, listen, only for your eyes to see. Okay. Yeah, whatever, babe. Okay. Look, y'all. Focus. 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 Mr. Murphy. I love it, but hold it for a second, if you don't mind. Okay, y'all. Let me go back up. The imperial cult is folded into the Jesus Christ cult, and in 381, Jesus Christ is fused with God. Hearsay is defined as treason punishable by death. The pagan opposition is eliminated. I'm sorry. She is her. She talked to I'm sorry, yeah. We, we, we. Temples are converted into churches or clothes, abandoned and pillaged. It's not that I don't want y'all down here, but if y'all can be quiet and come listen, you just pull up a chair beside me so they can see your handsome face, babe. He'll sit down here from time to time. Sometimes he'll be quiet over here in the background. Y'all hear him. The Christian canon is determined and unauthorized scriptures are outlawed and burned. Creeds are established, learned by rote. Allegorical interpretation of scripture is superseded by literal interpretation. Christian holy pageants proliferate. Traditional shrines and sacred places in Palestine are sequestered for the life of Jesus. Behold the invention of saints and the veneration of bones. A heroic history of the one true church is written. That's my overview. We might usefully refine the detail, but no pet theory is required. <laughs> Tiffany, I'm going to tell him that. I'm going to tell him. Go on upstairs. Marriage goes. Hey. Okay, next question. He asks, that's quite a distillation. But if we accept the notion that the Jesus story evolved in such a way through a centuries-long politically influenced process of borrowing and grafting and cobbling and conflation and a bit of helpful fabrication here and there, and that the story congealed in a competitive cultural environment where other myths and stories were in currency, one salient question would seem to be, why? Or more specifically, why Jesus? What was the appeal of the synthesized Christ narrative that carried such lasting resonance that it would come to be codified while other myths were being swept aside? Is it possible that the dominance of one story can ultimately be understood as a stochastic phenomenon as a chance event like a lottery pick or a mutation? Were the early apostles and subsequent 
editors just better admin? Or should we consider deeper cultural, psychological, or even philosophical factors to account for the ascent of Christianity over, say, Mithraism? Did the Jesus story scratch a particular, perhaps innate, human itch in some way that contending myths did not? In other words, what, if anything, do you think Christianity represents both in its inception and over the course of the last two millennia? And he answers, many, many questions. <laughs> but let's address the central issue. Let's address the central issue here. Why did the Jesus Christ cult succeed and the others fail? No, its triumph was not the result of random chance or heaven forbid because Christianity had a superior philosophy. The truth is more mundane. Let's first of all remember that during the second and third centuries, Christianity was no particular success at all. For one thing, Christianity existed in a number of localized variations, rival sects, S-E-C-T-S, often violently inclined toward each other, even though all were nominally Christian. The movement had no widespread support, and the evidence we have suggests that, for example, both Mithraism and Judaism were gaining momentum. But when we hit the third century crisis within the empire, particularly in the second half of that century, when the Augustan system collapsed, Two emperors died at the hands of Rome's enemies. There was, in, there was indiscipline of the troops and chronic inflation. There were incursions of northern barbarians as far south as Spain and Anatolia. There was the sack of Antioch by the Persians and the breakaway of the Gallic and Palm, Palmyrene sub-empires. Faced with such anxiety-inducing perils, the Imperium needed something both to protect itself and to enforce loyalty across the empire. So why did Christianity, with its Jesus, fit the bill? It was both authoritarian and adaptable. The bishops, having secured for themselves divinely ordained command over their communities, emerged as powerful figures acting outside the imperial system. The church itself had become a state within the state, providing its own bread and circuses. As the church matured, so did its wealth and ambition grow. It increasingly detached itself from purely parochial loyalties and presented itself as a universal or Catholic salvation. It could readily shift its command centers as politics required from Alexandria to Antioch, from Rome to Constantinople. In doctrinal terms, Catholic orthodoxy in particular was utterly opportunistic. In the cause of gathering its flock, it would forgive any crime, absorb any pagan motif. In operational terms, again, Catholicism was, <clears throat> was ruthlessly pragmatic and able to preach simplicity, poverty, and the virtue of suffering to meet the masses, yet simultaneously glorify and sanctify any imperial extravagance. The polytheists and philosophers might have put up a better resistance to such a fanatically ambitious and self-serving creed, but they were slow to recognize its dangers. When they did so, the imperial household had already embraced the Christian formulas that they found so useful. Oh, oh yeah, we are at an hour. Y'all, I want to finish this. Okay. When they did so, the imperial household had already embraced the Christian formulas that they found so useful liberty of thought of, or what the church called heresy, 
became treason, both to emperors and to churchmen. Perhaps we should note here that the historical alternative to Christianity was not simply one of the mystery religions like Mithraism, but rather Mithraism plus an ethical system from one of the philosophies, say Stoicism, plus a public ceremonial, ceremonial religion, say the cult of Magna Mater. In other words, part of Christianity's winning formula was that it reduced all of these areas to the simple story of Jesus Christ and sold this story through a disciplined marketing hierarchy. The opposition never got its act together. Next question. Mythicist arguments frequently begin with the claim that there are no strictly contemporary references or artifacts to attest to the existence of a historical Jesus that such early sources cited by Christian historicists date from periods after the time when Jesus is said to have lived. This seems like a compelling point, and I've never seen it credibly contested. At the same time, one might plausibly push back by asking whether it is reasonable to expect to find contemporaneous source material given the dearth of primary documentation that has passed down from antiquity. What, in your view, is the significance of the no contemporary evidence claim? Couldn't the same line of argument be leveraged to argue against the historical status of other figures from the same period, applying the same standard? Can we really be sure that, say, Pontius Pilate existed? His answer, an interesting choice, Pontius Pilate. First, we have references to Pontius Pilate in ancient literature. Philo of Alexandria, a contemporary of Pilate, writes of him, as does Josephus about 40 years later. In addition, we have the famous Pilate Stone, a dedication to Tiberius, which names Pilate found at Caesarea. So Pilate's existence is secure. But with Jesus, we are on much thinner ice. Philo, a prolific writer on religion, has nothing to say about Jesus and the notorious paragraph in Josephus naming Jesus the Christ is, universal, is universally acknowledged to have been tampered with. The Gospels themselves are late in terms of providing witness statements and in order to finesse away this embarrassment, Christian apologetics has invented a new species of witnesses the near witness, so the greatest event in all of history, is argued by comparison to the lateness of copies of Homer, Caesar, etc. The believer is asked to accept the reasonableness of testimony written by many decades after the supposed events by unknown authors in unknown places who were not themselves witnesses. Yes, it's true that copies of pre-Christian literature are sparse, but then Christian book burning has a lot to answer for. Jesus artifacts. Through the dark centuries of Christendom, Jesus artifacts were everywhere. His milk, teeth, his tears, his blood, his crown of thorns, etc., etc. The only trouble, as we all now realize, was that all this evidence was fake fabricated by the church to fill the gullible with awe. Would a real historical person have needed fabrication on such an industrial scale? Nobody needed to fake evidence for Caesar. Next question. Speaking of artifacts, what is your take on the Shroud of Turin, a forgery? Decades ago, the story was that radiocarbon dating traced the Shroud to the Middle Ages, but I understand that some scholars aren't convinced. His answer, oh my, the shroud. That length of hallowed claw says a great deal about the fans of Jesus and nothing at all about the man. Those guys even invented a name for its study, syndonology, to elevate its importance as a mysterious artifact. 
three professional laboratories independently tested the cloth and concurred to its medieval origin. That was definitive as far as any rational consideration was concerned, but the make-believers could not handle that and immediately shouted foul. For over a quarter of a century, they have continued to strategize how to reverse the verdict of modern science, but that's the way with faith. You know what you believe. You know what you believe to begin with. Therefore, you adjust the facts to confirm your belief. Yes, yes. We all know Josephus had shenanigans he was tampered with. Okay. Next question. <clears throat> we almost done. Y'all, if y'all got to go to work, go on, get out of here and render unto Caesar what it's doing to Caesar. I ain't on Caesar's time. I'm Caesar. I'm the captain now, right? So I can be here, but I really want to finish this today. But I don't want y'all. If y'all supposed to be at work, don't be violating company time, right? And don't blame it on me, right? I'm telling y'all, go to work. This is recorded. Come back and listen to it when you get off work if you got to go to work. If you're here, you off, you on break, whatever. Okay, we're going to keep rolling until we finish this because I want to finish this today, right? And I'm going to have to hurry up because we got to leave. We got to go to Richmond. All right, next question. Things become more interesting when we turn to what might be described as near contemporaneous sources, especially such non-Christian references as have been identified in the works of Josephus and Tacitus. These are the sources most often cited as convergent extra-biblical evidence for the literal existence of Jesus. But what's curious is that the relevant passages have long been attended by controversy including allegations in the case of Josephus of interpolations by later Christian scribes. How do you interpret these sources and their ostensible references to Jesus? Do you regard the key of passages authentic? K.H. Well, he responded. Kenneth Humphreys, that's his initials. An unfortunate fact is that we are indebted to Christian scribes for copying and thus preserving the ancient text. This also means this also means that Christians selected the text that they deemed worthy of copying and most pre-Christian texts were lost because they were not regarded as worthy. Those same scribes also had the opportunity and motive for amending texts to confirm the gospel story. Thus, the doctored histories of Josephus survive, but not the histories of Justice of Tiberius. The amended history of Tacitus survive, but not the critical works of Christianity from Celsius and Porphyry. Thus, extra biblical material. Thus, extra biblical material does nothing for the case for a, for a historical Jesus. In the paragraph in Josephus' Antiquities, the interpolation is crude and obvious. The Tacitus passage is more polished, but still a fraud. Even if it were genuine, it still only regurgitates the claims made by Christians in Tacitus' own day, the early 2nd century. And the same holds true for for that other pagan witness and contemporary of Tacitus, Pliny the Younger. We all are familiar with Pliny the Younger, right? We learned about him. He was he was with the shenanigans too, helping to fabricate books in the New Testament. And you can hear more about him if you go back to when we were reading the true authorship of the New Testament. It will tell you who wrote every single book while Christian pastors who may know or may not know are lying to you, telling you that the author is unknown. They know who the authors are who wrote these books. Okay. Even if it were genuine, it still only regurgitates the claims made by Christians in Tacitus' own day, the early 2nd century. And the same holds true for the other pagan witness and contemporary of Tacitus, Pliny the Younger. Confirmation of Christian belief in a God called Christ is no evidence for a man called Jesus. Next question. Given that our understanding of ancient history is limited by selective bias and probably contaminated at terms. Yes, baby. Yes, 
yesterday. A boy was and Sai was singing a song. And Sai was leave the kingdom. Sing, leave the kingdom. Guess what? What? Sai, Sai said, them love, them don't love, them don't have, have a little sister. So that made you upset? But weren't they playing? They created their own kingdom, right? I mean, like, I guess that kind of sucks. I'll talk to them. I'm going to tell them not to create a kingdom without you. All right. Okay? Okay. Okay. Tell Josiah if he builds a kingdom without his sister, I'm going to revoke his crown. I'm going to take his crown, and I'm going to put his crown on my head, and I'm going to take his staff, and I'm going to use it in my videos. And mommy, next must be mine. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take the crown and hand it over to you, sis. Okay. All right, y'all. Given that our understanding of ancient history is limited by selective bias and probably contaminated at turns, does it surprise you that early Christian scribes didn't go much further in their revisionist overlay of text? The, uh, the ostensibly non-Christian sources that receive attention are few and suspected instances of tampering have the appearance of editorial adjustment rather than long form invention. Why would we be left with only these few crude instances of interpolative finagling of arguably minimal significance? Could it have been that the opportunity and motive to construct more elaborate hoaxes was held in check by other forces? His answer, yes. If they were lying, why didn't they make a better job of it? This argument is an old chestnut from apologetics. It often appears under the banner of embarrassing errors. So impelled were the writers to tell the truth that they faithfully recorded even material that ostensibly wasn't helpful to their cause. But hey, excuse me, but hey, their honesty shows they can be trusted. The problem here is projecting back into the ancient world a modern era sophistication that was never the case. The gospel literature emerged at a time of mass illiteracy a tiny clique of scribes and priests wrote and had access to text, T-E-X-T-S. By the time the era of fabrication and the battle for truth drew to a close, the text had become sacred literature too precious for vulgar eyes. Priests extracted whatever homilies they thought suitable for their flocks. The pagan philosophers finally woke up to the danger that an intolerant orthodoxy posed and that prompted the first century of falsified history. But by then, the church was triumphant and could silence its critics by physical methods. The masses were, re the masses were read to. They enacted authorized pageants. They were overawed by imagery. Who was left to question the veracity of Holy Scripture? There was no need for more ambiguous forgeries. Relics provided all the evidence that was ever needed. Only a thousand years later, when the system became so corrupt that it exploded in the Reformation, did the sacred text become more widely available, and that's when critical scholarship began. Even so, the Protestant ref even even so. The Protestant reformers were doctrinal purists, not critical thinkers, and this was a second period of falsified history. The printing press restrained the fabricators, but it has never stopped the subtle and continuing modification of the text, even today. <laughs> I know, right? She's just the sweetest thing melts your heart. Give the crown to me, mommy. I'm going to get a crown of sis. Next question, and we almost done, y'all. This may be a bit of a tangent, but I noted that the criteria of embarrassment and difficulty are curiously cited as evidence for a historical Jesus in a review essay devoted to the documentary film Zeitgeist, 
that Tim Callahan, a secular Bible scholar, wrote for a skeptic magazine. It might be useful to get your response. To frame the issue, here is a relevant excerpt, which I will quote at some length. Okay, so here's the portion that he pulls out. I'm going to repeat it. Quote, we can imply the existence of a historical Jesus from the criteria of embarrassment and difficulty. The criterion of embarrassment says that people do not make up embarrassing details about someone they wish to revere. So if they say such things about the person, they are probably true. Now let's apply this to what the Roman historian Tacitus had to say about Jesus early in the second century. Concerning rumors that had spread that Nero had deliberately set fire to the city of Rome, Tacitus says, The Annals of Imperial Rome, Book 1, Chapter 15. To suppress this rumor, Nero fabricated scapegoats and punished with every refinement the notoriously depraved Christians, as they were called. Their originator, Christ, had been executed in Tiberius' region by the governor of Judah, Pontius Pilate. But in spite of this temporary setback, the deadly superstition had broken out afresh, not only in Judea, where the mischief had started, but even in Rome. All degraded and shameful practices collect and flourish in the capital. That Tacitus is obviously a hostile witness, makes it much more likely that he accepted Jesus as a real person. Had he not reason to suspect he was nothing more than a fabrication, Tacitus would certainly have said so. The authors claim that Jesus had been executed by Pontius Pilate could only have come from one of two possible sources. Either Tacitus knew this to be true from the extant imperial records, or he was repeating what Christians themselves had said of Jesus. Were Jesus a mythical character? they had invented they certainly wouldn't have gone out of their way to invent his being a criminal who had been executed in like manner people do not go out of their way to invent difficulties for a character they have invented it is clear from the nativity narratives of the gospels of matthew and luke that they were faced with having to explain why jesus grew up in galilee if he was born in bethlehem both gospels had to invent rather convoluted means to get jesus born in bethlehem according in accordance with the messianic prophecy in micah chapter 5 verse 2 then get him moved to nazareth clearly they were stuck with a real person known to have come from galilee when he should have come from bethlehem had they been making jesus up out of the whole cloth they would simply have said he came from bethlehem end of story no complications so the evidence for Jesus as a real historical personage, though meager, is solid, end quote. And so that's what he's asking him. He said, I want your take on this passage right here. That was a whole passage. So he read it and then he says, before you respond, let me emphasize a couple of, of contextual points. First, Callahan's appraisal of what he considers to be a meager yet solid line of interpretive evidence is offered in the pages of a magazine skeptic that is explicitly devoted to the critical evaluation of paranormal and supernatural including theistic claims second the specific context of his assignment of his assessment again a critique of an outlandish documentary a documentary documentary tends to cast the mythicist position in unflattering light as a kind of fringe obsession as opposed to a species of legitimate skeptical inquiry a two-part question follows first what do you make of callahan's interpretation second what's going on here do you find it curious or perhaps convenient that the mythicist argument should be framed in this way as a kind of crackpot nostrum in other words why isn't skeptic more skeptical? Is this kind of framing part of what you refer to as the new apologetics? His answer. 
there are a number of points of confusion here. So we need to unpack Callahan's argument step by step. He cites three examples that for him imply histori historicity. One, Tacitus likely accepted Jesus as a real person. Two, Christians would not have invented an executed criminal. Number three, Matthew and Luke were stuck with the real person from Galilee, compelling them to invent a convoluted story involving Bethlehem, a prophecy from Micah and Nazareth. Let's set aside legitimate concerns about Christian tampering with Tacitus and accept that Tacitus both wrote the passage in Annals, actually book 15, chapter 44, and had himself accepted that Christus had been executed by a Roman procurator. Imperial archives would never have provided Tacitus with such an inconsequential snip of information about an unknown bandit in a marginal sub-providence 80 years earlier. The information could only have come from Christians of Tacitus' own day. If Tacitus knew that the sectarians called themselves Christians, why on earth should he doubt their own claim that they took their name from an originator called Christ? There is absolutely no witness to a Jesus in any of this, and Tacitus does not use the word Jesus. Hostile or not, we all all we have is Tacitus quoting what Christians said of their own origins. By the way, the years 30 and 31 of Tacitus' account of the reign of Tiberius and the annals are mysteriously missing. What might those lost chapters have said or not said about Jesus? Did Christian scribes have a reason to destroy them? In an earlier work where the historian wrote specifically about Judea, in a 6,000 word essay beginning with various theories about the origins of the Jews and ending with the siege of Jerusalem by Titus, and you can find that in the histories in book 5, not a single word speaks of Christ, Christians, or a religious revolution. In fact, of the time of Jesus, Tacitus wrote simply, in Tiberius' reign, all was quiet. Note also that the controversial passage in the annals uses the word scapegoat because the notion of scapegoat sacrifice was well established within Judaism. The Christians took that notion and gave it their own spin, a sinless man sacrificing himself for the sins of others. So you really have to be careful in arguing what would or would not have been embarrassing to the original Christians. In fact, the criteria of embarrassment is a pretty feeble and much overused tool. Taken to extremes, it would mean that the more fantastical the claim, the more authentic it must be. Take the specific example given here of a real person from Galilee, Mark's Jesus the original was a sectarian, not a resident of Galilee, Jesus the Nazarene. Mark felt under no compunction at all to have his Jesus born in Bethlehem or anywhere else for that matter. It is Matthew's revision of Mark that introduces an auspicious birth in Bethlehem. For that birth, Mary and Joseph do not inconveniently live in Galilee, but very conveniently live in Bethlehem. Yes, Matthew does have a convoluted story, but that story actually works in the other direction. Contriving wise men, Egypt, and an unknown prophecy to move the Holy Family into, not away from Nazareth. So we are left with Luke who sat down and wrote a story and was supposedly compelled to use one fact, a real person known to have come from Galilee. This is nonsense. Known to whom? It wasn't even known to Mark or Matthew. In reality, Luke had before him at least two earlier versions of the Jesus story, Mark's and Matthew's, which he rewrote, redacted, and extended with additional fictional elements of his own. And Luke does not refer to Micah. Quite why skeptic Callahan should conclude that this amounts to a meager but solid evidence is beyond me. It certainly is meager, but it is far from solid. But one thing I've noticed among some sections of the, of the skeptical atheist community is a quite tenacious attachment to their own Jesus, who is, of course, a rational humanist just like themselves. 
Some, I'm sure, want to use this nice guy Jesus as a critic of the church and others battling against God just do not want to open up a second front and appear extreme. Next question. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that most people, including many secular scholars, find support for a historical Jesus in the Christian canon, even if they reject supernatural claims in the New and Old Testament. You have written extensively about how the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus can be understood as essentially fictional narratives. But before we address specific problems and questions, it might be useful to know what, if any, historical value you assign to the primary literature of Christianity. What is your view of the Bible as history or more liberally as a particular lens through which history can be interpreted? I'm really trying to push this, y'all. I'm going to answer this question. We're going to have to stop. We're going to we're gonna have to stop. Because it's going to take me. Hmm, that's going to probably take me at least 20 more minutes. 20 more minutes to read. Okay, let's answer this question. The New Testament books are extremely important source material from an early date. But a source of what? Not first century events, but second century beliefs and didactic material about the first century. They tell us a lot about what early Christians believed, argued about, and would have others believe. And that is very important to our understanding of Christianity's origins. But they tell us nothing about an authentic life of someone called Jesus. Though on the surface, a simple enough tale of a meandering holy man who finally arrives in Jerusalem for execution, the fourfold gospel tale is a heavily redacted narrative revised and rearranged repeatedly. New Testament scholarship is essentially about recovering the primary material before it went into the blender. Because overwhelmingly, scholars drawn into this field have been believers. Always, always the assumption has been that a real Jesus lies beneath the many layers of artifice, no matter what scholarship reveals. But the evidence does not point to a real man at all. Remove the miraculous and plagiarized element from any of the Jesus stories. And what do you have? A man strolling about. Such a figure is quite redundant to a tale of hope and salvation. Jesus had no more existence than any other ancient God. Next question. Of course, the process of recovering primary Christian source material has been complicated at turns, perhaps most profoundly by the discovery of the Nag Hammadi corpus about which so much has been written in recent years. How would you characterize the significance of this event and of Gnostic tradition generally in the scheme of mythicist research? Do the Gnostic Gospels support the thesis that Greco-Roman mystery religions played an influential role in the development of early Christian beliefs? And what do you make of Elaine Pagel's popular interpretation emphasizing the possible influence of Buddhist traditions and Christian thought? His answer. As for Buddhist influence, Pagel is right, of course. I wrote on this more than a decade ago. We can identify opportunity, motive, method, location, and scriptural evidence for a Buddhist influence in Christianity's origins. The Nag Hammadi Library provides us with a window back to a time that the Holy Mother Church never intended we should see. The church was bent on eliminating error from the world, and that included all trace of its own murky origins. It manufactured a myth of unsullied and heroic descent from Jesus and the apostles. But Nag Hammadi gave the lie to that monstrous deceit. Here are a collection of texts written and used by alternative Christians whose language is familiar, yet whose content is strangely different. Here are Jesus and his apostles in unfamiliar settings and saying different and often startling things. For mythicists, 
Nag Hammadi was powerful confirmation of what they had long said. So-called so orthodoxy emerged from a potpourri of speculations and not from any historical reality. Let me see how many more questions. We got one, two, three, four, five. Six more questions. What y'all think? I'm going to ask y'all. Should I read these last six questions and answers and just be done with this today? Like I really want to. Don't let me persuade you. I want y'all to give me y'all honest answers. You're like, Pam, this is too much. Girl, I got to get out of here. I tried to stay as long as I could, but I got to go. Be honest with me. Y'all want me to read these last six questions and answers? I'll wait. The first answer wins it. I don't care either way. I told y'all what I want to do, but don't, like I said, don't let me persuade you. Use your own mind, you think. But the first answer wins it. Or if my husband come down here and say, shut the shop down, we out. Whichever one happened first. We're going to read these last six questions and answers, or we're going to go. Somebody answer. Finish, Jen. Here we go. We're going to finish. Okay. Now, if my husband come down here while I'm finishing this, we got to shut it down. Okay? All right. Just let y'all know now. Because we, we do. We have to get out of here. Okay. All right. Next question. Of course, the process of recovering primary Christian source material has been complicated at turns, perhaps most profoundly by the discovery of the Nag Hammadi corpus about which so much has been written in recent years. How would you characterize the significance of this event and of Gnostic tradition generally in the scheme of mythicist research? Do the Gnostic Gospels support the thesis that Greco-Roman mystery religions played an influ influential role in the development of early Christian beliefs? And what do you make of Elaine Pagel's... Hold on. No, I'm sorry. I just We just read that one. All right. In light of the emergence of such comparative Christian literature, it is interesting to return to the four canonized Gospels, if only to puzzle over the editorial process by which certain stories were chosen over others. With the extant pieces laid out, do you think we can arrive at an understanding of what church councils were trying to achieve when they sanctioned and incorporated some narrative accounts of the life of Christ to the exclusion of others? I should admit that I have this naive or maybe just cynical notion that it might have played out somewhat like we would expect in a modern Hollywood studio with executives green lighting certain projects that are anticipated to yield a higher box office return. Also, why do you suppose we end up with four gospels instead of just one authoritative biography? KH, his answer. There are two aspects here, the editorial selection and redaction of certain Jesus stories and the inclusion or exclusion of entire books in the approved canon. Church councils were primarily concerned with the latter, together with the imposition of church discipline. It is, of course, the case that so-called heretics had their favorite books, and within those books, Jesus stories that supported their beliefs. The very fact that the church was able to hold councils in the second and third centuries, that is well before it gained legal status, proves just how bogus is any claim that there was any widespread, serious, or sustained persecution. Councils were held even in Rome itself in 155 and 193, and repeatedly at Carthage and Antioch in the third century. The Roman state wasn't persecuting the church. The church was persecuting its own heretics. It was a synod of Hippo in 393 that first endorsed a canon that corresponds to the modern Catholic Bible, but harmonization across the whole Christian church was never achieved. People may speak of the Bible, but that in no way implies common agreement to a given set of words. It is sometimes supposed that the four Gospels were the product of four distinctive Christian communities, each with a unique interpretation of Jesus. Thus, for example, 
The Johannine community was especially concerned with Jesus as a divine savior and preserved its understanding in what became the Gospel of John. Elsewhere, where Matthean, Markan, and Lucan communities similarly codified their unique perspective into a gospel, but this idea of four communities is hogwash, lacking any historical support, and is simply hypothesized from the existence of the gospels themselves. We have a very compelling explanation for the four Gospels, a trajectory of development in which the author of Matthew tried to displace Mark's original work, but never quite succeeded because it was too well known. The author of Luke attempted to replace both Mark and Matthew with a much more polished work, extended into a second volume, which is rationalized, which rationalized the existence of the churches and a final work by the authors of John, which met the challenge of the Gnostic competition. But these four were only a subset of a much larger literature. After generations of wrangling, wrangling orthodoxy settled on the favorite four. At least one successful attempt was made at harmonizing the four into a single story, the Diatessaron of, Ty of Titan, a second century Syrian churchman. The Diatessaron was used in Syria for around 300 years before it was declared heretical. By then, Orthodoxy had realized just how useful were four alternative versions of the truth. <clears throat> the next question. Many scholars would concede that Jesus, as Son of God, never lived, but would point out that there were itinerant miracle workers in Palestine, that there were reformers like John the Baptist, and that people were crucified for challenging Roman authority. How do you respond to the thesis that Jesus was simply one of these types or a synthesis of several of these types. Can such a minimalist account be meaningfully distinguished from the idea that Jesus never existed as a specific historical personage? <clears throat> His answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even when you dream up a fictional character, you are consciously or not drawing on your own memories or knowledge of real people. You cannot do otherwise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those templates don't make your character real, not unless you draw a great deal from one particular character, in which case we would say that your fiction is a disguised or parodied version of this or that person. Yes, we all know that first century Palestine was awash with miracle workers, itinerant doom merchants, reformers, and revolutionaries. Some aspects of several of them may well have been drawn upon by the Jesus storytellers. If we are trying to argue that not several, but one in particular is the template for Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, I need to take a sip of water. <clears throat> But if we are trying to argue that not several, but one in particular, is the template for Jesus, then apart from asserting that to be true, how do we show it to be true or at least argue a plausible theory that connects that individual to the fiction we read in the gospel? I do not think it can be done. Perhaps the best known recent attempt is made by Bart Ehrman, who argues for a parochial and deluded doom merchant. But his arguments, such as they are, all come from the wrong direction, the Gospels. Are we really going to swallow the idea that some minor figure below the visible event horizon who did nothing of note and was unrecorded by anyone several decades later inspired his first biographer to write his story? By the same method, <clears throat> we could argue that Superman was real by simply asserting that mild-mannered reporters were commonplace Mommy. on the big city newspapers in 1930s Mom. in America. Yes, babe. Science, just, 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 just put my money up under the dresser. Well, why don't you get it down? No, I mean, got it down, them clothes, down them 
behind Demise's bathroom. Did you tell Dad? No. Go tell Dad. It's under under there with five of them. Tell Dad. Dad'll make him give it to you. Okay. By the same method, we could argue that Superman was real by simply asserting that mild-mannered reporters were commonplace on big city newspapers in 1930s America. In reality, Jerry Siegel, the author of the original Superman story, did not need a real reporter in focus to begin his fiction, and neither did Mark need a real carpenter. Mark had more than enough source material in Jewish, Jewish scripture. It may convince some people for a while, but a minimalist Jesus will go the same way as a minimalist Abraham and a minimalist Moses into the realm of mythology. I'm going to keep reading. Well, some of y'all start attacking me for that. Hold on. I started asking questions, but we're going to get into it. We're going to be able to separate truth from error, people. And stories and analogies from real life, because we can test, right? Don't beat me up about it when we get to it. Y'all definitely ain't ready for that yet. I'm just telling you, that's why we got to take it up a level so you can get yourself sensitive to the spirit of y'all. So he can let you know, yes, my child, this is true, right? Listen, next question. Skepticism about the existence of a historical Jesus has been formally articulated since at least early 19th century when Strauss and Bauer published their respective treaties, laying much of the foundation for the critique that continues today. Yes, baby. Okay. What's wrong? Don't give me my money back. Yeah. Where is it at? No, it was Dad just called you. Go ahead. Go, Josh. You go when you come out of the bathroom. Go tell Dad where what y'all did with her money. How did she even have five and all she had two? She got money like y'all got money. Me and Dad give her money. Don't just assume because she got more cash in her pocket than y'all may have that she that she shouldn't. We gave it to her. Go, go up there. Go, go talk to your father. Yet the thesis seems to have gained relatively little traction. What's new in the arena? Do you anticipate new discoveries or developments that will disturb the prevailing consensus? Answer, little traction, perhaps, but that is what makes the present era of instant global communication so encouraging. Take another discipline where a fringe theory after half a century became not just mainstream, but the consensus. Alfred Wingener presented the idea of continental drift before the First World War, but few people took it seriously until the paleomagnetism provided a missing piece of the puzzle in the 1950s. Now everyone accepts that plate. Now everyone accepts that plate tectonics is a primary feature of the Earth, and Wigner, Wigner has become fully vindicated. Yet, as much as Wigner had to challenge received wisdom and professional egos, he faced nothing remotely comparable to the entrenched interests of the global religious corporations or the emotional and the psychological dependencies of millions of their customers. So the early 21st century is a tremendous time for mythicism. Already it has compelled the mandarins of orthodoxy to rush out rebuttals. For the first time in almost a century, the words Jesus, if he even existed, are heard, are heard so often now from speakers in many different contexts. The message is getting through. The message is getting through, and some people is freaking out about it. What you mean, Jesus ain't real? They're speaking heresy. They didn't. I'm telling you, it is people wigging out about this. But before we even started reading this, when I really began to give myself over to tour and praying and stuff, and I'm like, something is really wrong here, right? <laughs> okay, the next question we got. I mean, one, two. 
to two more questions after this one, y'all. And then we'll be done. Okay. When I have discussed this issue with others, one objection that frequently comes up is that while a skeptical approach may permit the conclusion that the evidence for a historical Jesus is lacking or very scant and easily questioned, that this situation does not prove that such a man ever existed. You seem to be crystal clear in asserting that Jesus did not, in fact, exist. So how do you answer the propositional truism that one cannot prove a negative or the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence? I hope y'all caught that. I ain't going to repeat it. <laughs> answer. You know, it isn't quite true that you can't prove a negative. If my negative is there is no food in my fridge, it can be proved true by looking in my fridge and finding it empty. Bella, turn it down a little bit, please. With Jesus, the equivalent of looking into the fridge is to look everywhere we could reasonably expect to find evidence as if the guy had existed and finding none. And that, in fact, is the case. We got to cut it short, y'all. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> he came down here. All right, so we got to pause right there. I'm going to just tomorrow. We're going to read these last two questions tomorrow. But we're still going to start the other book tomorrow. We're going to finish these last two questions, and then we're going to start the book, y'all. But my husband said, cut it short. We got to roll. So we're going to pause right here. we still going to start tomorrow. We're just going to finish these last two. One, two. Well, three questions now because I didn't finish the answer to this one. These last three questions, and um, we're going to start a little bit of um, the new book. We're going to start the walk of the spirit, walk of the power. All right, beautiful people. Thank you for hanging out so long with me. We almost at the two hour mark. I was really trying to push it today. Y'all, it is Thursday, December the 16th, 2021, day 329 of year three of reading through the books of the law and the prophets and of the three year consecutive day count day 997 he like my husband called bella come on let's go she in the video let's so get it. Listen, um, i think i think uh if y'all gonna sit in the car she can come just get her phone everything new for her okay all right Tootie, you can roll with us yay okay y'all you're welcome jen guys the questions i'm gonna i'm gonna come back and read these questions Mommy, that y'all put in here but I can't answer them today. Yes, baby. I listen to you every time. I know you listen to me every time. All right, beautiful people. So we're about to do the blessing, which is found in Numbers and Daddy. Very good. Very obedient, beautiful child. Okay. The blessing is found in Numbers chapter 6. Hold on. Pull it up. Mommy. Yes, babe. What's your hair hurting? Um, I don't know. What you do to it, for you? <gasps> Mommy. There you go. Wash your hands. What is that? Who are you know. in? You don't know. Okay, y'all. I, I, this is what's candy. Okay. All right, y'all. So the blessing is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. We always just lift our hands to the Father, the Creator of the universe, the Great Spirit who created us all, right? And we just say the blessing. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise, ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Yahuwah will kneel before us presenting gifts, and he will guard us with the hedge of protection. Yahuwah will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards us, bringing order, and he will provide us with love, sustenance, and friendship. Yahuwah will lift up his wholeness of being and look upon us, and he will set in place all we need to be whole and complete. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. All right, beautiful people. Mommy, I love right. y'all. Let's, let's do this hard. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to squeeze your hand, girl. All right, y'all. Love y'all. Thank y'all for hanging out. Y'all the real MVPs. Y'all the real G's. I see y'all tomorrow bright and early. 7.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Go ahead, end it to the baby so we can roll. Daddy, wait. Mom, what side press? This one or this one? Whichever. I'll let you choose. You choose, Tootie. You choose. You've been here long enough. I'll let you, I'll let you drive it. Oh, you want to use my finger. Okay. Which one? This one. This one? Okay. I can get done. There you go. You can see it. There you go. All right, y'all. Please. <laughs> end it, baby girl. Come on. She ending y'all first today, Facebook. Sorry. I mean, YouTube. 
Okay. Well, you want to talk of them one, two. Go ahead. Everybody, they left. Go ahead, end it. They left? Yep, they left. We're still up here. Yeah, no. It stopped recording. Go ahead and hit finish up here.